Amen. Amen. The title of tonight's message is Put It in God's Hands. Nothing extravagant. Probably probably been a, a title of many messages. Uh, but that's uh, the title that we've got tonight and where we're at tonight. And I want to bring encouragement tonight. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone in here needs encouragement. Uh, anybody in here need any encouraging? Any encouragement? Mm, I got one, two, three. Okay. Oh, oh, there's a lot of people. Okay, good. So, <laughs> praise the Lord. Because uh, my next question was, does anybody want hellfire and brimstone? Because uh, <laughs> Lord probably send that too. Amen. But yeah, I, I I hope you need encouragement because that's what the Lord sent to us tonight to be encouraged. Amen. Uh, before I get started, um, Sister Nicole had was telling Pastor of a story that was so encouraging. It, I, it fired Pastor Cates up, and it, it really did fire me up too. Uh, we have a young, young, young man, and when I mean young, I mean like little bitty, little, little, little Colt Stiefel, and probably first grader Nicole. So he's in first grade, and it, it'd be all right to tell this story. You think? You know, we'll, we'll, yeah, we, we'll cut this and not put it on YouTube. Uh, so anyways, so there, there, you know, first day of school, you know, crazy times. First day of school is always crazy. Now, if you're an educator, you know, first day of school is crazy. It don't matter. I taught 10 years at the high school. It don't matter how much I prepared. It don't know how much I planned. It didn't matter how much I cleaned. There's something crazy going to happen on the first day, somewhere, somehow, some way. Uh, so the first graders apparently were on the playground, uh, and I, I, we won't tell you about the school, but anyways, it was at a certain school, and you might can figure it out. Well, you're probably going to figure it out when I tell you uh, the, the, the great part of the story. So anyways, they, they're down at a, a playground. Well, the, the playground is actually the city park because the city park's right next to the school. And um, anyways, if you, <laughs> it's five facilities. So I'll just tell you where it's at because you can't get the visual if you don't know. So, you know, five school and the playground's all right there connected. You know, so the kids, they just bring the kids down to the playground and play. So anyways, uh, and I don't know Ruby, Ruby, right, little Ruby, uh, there's a, there's a little young lady, Ruby, skin her leg, uh, was bleeding, and, and one of the PE coaches, Coach Mashburn, if you know him, he's been around a long time, seasoned veteran, told little Colt, say, Colt, um, you need, take little Ruby to the bathroom and get something, and wipe that, wipe that, you know, that, that little skin part where she's bleeding because she was skin up a little bit, she fell, you know, playground stuff, normal stuff, nobody's crying, nobody's upset, just we need to get that blood cleaned up. So Colt goes over there, and uh, from what we understand, and, and and they they go to, into the bathroom and they get it and clean up and uh, and well they went into the ladies' bathroom first and there was no nothing in there so no paper towels no nothing uh, so then they uh, so he said well let's go you know cold I guess just takes him in the boys' bath goes takes him in the boys' bathroom because that's what little uh, you know little boys and girls at that age they don't they don't know but I think he probably thought well, let's go in the girls' bathroom first because you're a girl. And uh, nothing in the girls' bathroom. So they go in the boys, and there is some stuff, paper towels and stuff in the boys' bathroom. And I, I can't tell this story as good as Nicole because it was great when she told it. Anyway, so they get everything cleaned up, and they're going to get out of the bathroom, go back to the crew, and they're locked. It's locked. There's no door handle in the men's bathroom, and the, it locked behind them, and they can't get out. So time goes on, and that, the PE teachers and stuff, they, you know, they, they, the kids, you know, we, you're on a schedule. You know, oh, time to go. Let's go. Everybody go. Herding cats. They're everywhere. You know, so I imagine, I, I mean, I've been there and lived it and saw it. They're just, you know, you're just herding cats. Come on, little ones. Come on, come on. You know, so they get them back in the classroom. Well, the teachers start realizing they're missing two. And uh, so, so you know, the teacher, and I can't remember the teacher's name, calls the other teacher, says, you got those two? You got Colt and Ruby? You got them? No, no, no. So so they, they, they tell Coach Mashburn. Coach Mashburn goes down there running, you know, probably. I, and I can just visualize Coach Mashburn. Coach Mashburn, he, listen, I, I've known him for a long time. I got to work with him. He, you know, I don't know what you know about him, but what I know about him, he's a fine man. And I can just see him. I can picture him just kind of trying to get down there as fast as he can. So he gets down there, and sure enough, he gets them, and I guess they're pretty cool about everything, gets them out of the bathroom. Well, the great part of the story is what Nicole said. said Colt said, well, I took her in the girls' bathroom first, but there wasn't nothing in there. This is Colt's side of the story. So we went into the boys' bathroom. Like, you know, maybe we didn't supposed to go in there. But we went in there, and there's paper towels and everything, but we're locked in there. And all I know is I prayed three times, and then there was Coach Mashburn. 
I prayed three times, and Coach Mashford was there. Hallelujah. How about, how about we put it in God's hands? And I started thinking about what she said, and Kay said, you need to, you got to tell that. And I, thought, and I started thinking, well, I need to tell that. And I thought what the title of the message was, and I thought, even at a babe, when they were locked in the bathroom and stood are yelling, crying, crying, I don't know, I might have been going hysterical. Hey, she said, we'll just pray. Just pray three times, and then look, Coach Mashburn shows up. You talk about increasing it, just put it in God's hand. Sometimes you're locked in a place that you can't get out of and you just need to put it in God's hands. And God may not show up the first time and He may not show up the second time, but keep on praying. He'll show up. For Colt and little Ruby, He showed up on the third time in, in the form of Coach Mashburn. Amen. Just put it, I want to encourage you to put it in God's hands tonight. As I was running today... I, I was thinking about ministry tonight and how I needed God's inspiration. Me and Kate had, as we talk at different times, we had talking, we, we talked about you know preaching and being inspired of God the other day. And I was thinking about that as I was running and as I knew that I was supposed to preach tonight. And I, I needed inspiration from God. I was also, and for some reason, somehow these got tied together. I don't know how these got tied together, but I've been struggling the last few days about our government, about our politics, and just feeling kind of disgruntled about our nation and just the political landscape of it, all at the same time. And, and as I was running, I spoke through the breathing and I spoke through the pain of the asphalt and, and I just said out loud, I just said it out loud while I was going down the road uh, that I'm just going to put it in your hands, God. I'm just going to put this in your hands. And as soon as I spoke it, I felt faith being exercised. I was trying to exercise my physical body, but I felt exercising of my faith when I spoke it out of my mouth. Not when I thought it, not when it was just in here, but when I spoke it out of my mouth, I felt faith rise up in me and exercise because when I said it, I believed it. I believed it in my heart. I believed it in my mind. But when it come out of my mouth through the breathing and through the pain of my joints, it made a difference. can't see this. I'm going to have to blow it up. So, I felt faith exercised. I was running by heart rate, and I even looked down, and I saw that my heart rate was even beginning to calm down. It was even going down uh, as I had spoke it, and the Spirit began to slow my, my heart rate monitor on my wrist down. I think we just got to put it in God's hands. Whatever it is, we've just got to put it in God's hands. That doesn't mean we don't care. That doesn't mean we're not concerned. But we will not be in despair by it. Whatever it is for you, we will not be in despair by it. 2 Corinthians 4, 10 out of the NIV says, We are pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, we're puzzled, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we are not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. In us lives the belief that God sent His special Son to die for the sins of the world. And just not corporately did He die for the sins of the world. It's just not a view of a corporate. You and I were not just the bonus. See, I think sometimes we, we take salvation and take the death on the cross like he died for the whole world and, you know, I just happened to get chosen, born again, so I was just a bonus to him. No, he actually died for you and he actually died for me. It just wasn't so big and corporate that he didn't know who you were. He knew exactly who you were and he died for you. You're not his bonus. You are individually the prize to him. Because we carry that with us everywhere we go. That he died for you and he died for me and I'm his prize. I mean, if, if I die for something, there's a prize I'm dying for. There's something I'm dying for. There's something of meaning that I'm laying my life down for. And that meaning was you. He died for you. 
Just as he died for everybody in this great big world that they might have an opportunity, he died individually for you. You're not his bonus. You are the prize. Because we carry that with us everywhere we go, we also carry his life with us. We carry his total package of his teachings, of his directions, of his grace, of his mercies. The life that he lived, that we mimic and we strive to live. We carry that with us everywhere we go. We just need to put it in God's hands. Amen? Just put it in God's hands. Psalms 25, 1 through 5, out of the New American Standard Version, or New American Standard Bible says this, To you, Lord, I lift up my soul. My God in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies rejoice over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, Lord. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I will wait all the day. All day long, I wait on you, Lord. Did you know that there's an there's an easy read version of the Bible? I've never known that till I saw it today. I don't I don't know if it's a very good version of the Bible, but I actually come across it today, and I, I read this scripture, and it kind of captivated me a little bit in the easy read version. It says this: It says, "Lord, I put my life in your hands. I trust you, my God." And I'll not be disappointed. My enemies will not laugh at me. And no one who trusts in you will ever be disappointed. I promise you this tonight. If you put it in his hands, you will not be disappointed. He is not a disappointer. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to get exactly what you want. But I promise you, he'll give you exactly what you need. Amen. So many times in my life I prayed and I've sought God and I said, God, take this from me. God, bring me this. God, help me with this. God, anoint me with this. And I didn't always get it like I thought I'd get it. I didn't always get it took away like I thought it would be taken away. But I promise you he is never, ever, ever disappointed in what he does in your life, in my life, and in the church. Somebody say amen. He will not disappoint. Even though my enemies are there, they're not going to laugh at me. They're not going to destroy me. They're not going to... See, what's your, anxiety might be your enemy, all right? Amen? I, I, depression might be your enemy, all right? Your worry might be your enemy. Drugs might be your enemy. Alcohol might be your enemy. Pain might be your enemy. Whatever it is, your broken heart might be your enemy. It is not going to destroy me and you because we're going to put it in God's hands. He will not disappoint. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11 out of the New American Standard Version. It preludes to us in the first five verses. Elders set an example. Peter says, elders set an example. Care for people, elders. Care for younger people. All right? That, that, I don't know what that means. You may be 70. You may be caring for a 50-year-old. You may be 50, mentoring a 30-year-old. You may be 30, mentoring a 60-year-old. Right? Elders, those that are elder in the Lord, care for those that are younger. Set an example mentor them, care for them. And then he says, young men, be subject. Don't be proud that you're, that you, you know, you've got all this young and physicality and this energy. Don't be proud and boastful about that, but be subject to those that are, el- that set that example, that care for you. Listen, I'm not, you know, some, everybody wants to get upset about, oh, you just, get, just because you're old, doesn't mean somebody needs to subject themselves to you. But because you're an elder and you set an example and you care, 
and you're full of the Holy Ghost and you're righteous because God's righteous and you walk the walk and you talk the talk I need to be subject to you I, I need to set pride aside I need to set my uh, excitement aside I need to set my enthusiasm aside and hear what you might have to say or what you might have to pour in you and honor you <clears throat> he says young men subject, be subject don't be proud because God is opposed to the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Sometimes we got to get pride out of our way so we can put it in God's hand. we got to get the knowledge that we know how things should work. And what we think's right may not be right. Does God think it's right? Because listen, I can find a, a, a ton of logical excuses. Of good justifications of scientific theory and algorithms that will tell me I'm right in the things I do. I can find books, I can find people that would agree with me that something in my life is all right to do, to conduct myself a certain way. They say, they hit you, you hit them back. I can find all kinds of things, but that doesn't mean anything if God says no to. Some people will say, well, Tom, why don't you do certain things? It, there's nothing wrong with that. And I say, just because God won't let me. I said, you may feel like there's nothing wrong with that. And that's fine. I'm not here to argue what's right and wrong. But what I'm trying to tell you, what if I do it and God's told me not to do it, it's wrong and sin for me. It's wrong and sinful, and I do not want to separate myself from God. Some things you just got to put in God's hands. We can make up a hundred... We can say, I can't quit. I'm addicted. I can't quit. And then the next thing is, that, well, one big thing is, I don't want to quit. I can't quit, and I don't want to quit. You need to put it in God's hands. Put it in God's hands. Put it in God's hands. You've got to get the proud out of the way. Those that come clean and just say, listen, I, don't, I can't quit this. I can't stop this. I can't fix this. There's so many times I say, I can't fix it. It's just like tonight when I was running, I thought me and Kate had that conversation about preaching from the inspiration, being inspired to preach have an inspiration and as I was running today I, I just thought I just thought God you know I can I, 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 I'm educated thank God for it and I can put things together me, me and Case was talking about you know we always joke around about buying sermons you know, hey I got that off Presbyterian.com it was it was on sale for a dollar we joke about that but it's not really far from the truth either <laughs> if I want to get a sermon I go buy it online I can buy a book full of sermons I I'm, listen I can probably get online. Stephen Furtick will sell me anything I want to sell, anything he wants to sell me. I mean, there's there's preachers that will share everything with you, sell it to you, whatever. I can give it to you. But if it's not in God's hands, what good is it? And I was thinking, God, I can I I can I can con concoct something, but it's no good if it's not from you. It's no good if you didn't send it. It's no good if, you, if it's not inspired by you. So I said, God, I'll just put it in your hands. I'm just going to let you have total control. Now, 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11 says this, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at a proper time. Somebody needs to allow God just to lay his hand on them. Listen, therefore humble yourselves under what? The mighty hand of God. How many of you would just love to have the mighty hand of God on you? He said, all you got to do to have the mighty hand of God, just humble yourself. What does that mean? That doesn't mean be weak. That means be honest that you can't fix what needs to be fixed. You can't handle what you're trying to handle on your own. You've got to get rid of what you can't get rid of by yourself. And humble yourself and be honest and let the mighty hand of God be on top of you. And then raise you. Look at that. The hand of God on top of you, but yet will exalt you in proper time. 
When you are exalted, I want to tell you what you're going to look back on was what that proper time was. That proper time is the process. I found out something in my life. If some things, if the fingers are snapped and it's just that quick, you'll never appreciate it. You'll never learn anything. You'll never grow. But humble yourself by the, and let the mighty hand of God raise on you that he may exalt you in proper time. So when you are exalted, when you are raised out of your troubles, out of your drugs, out of your alcohol, out of whatever else is cursing you and pulling you down, your anxiety, your worry, your depression, your sickness, whatever your sin is, whatever my sin is, whatever it is that you are struggling with right now, anger, Sometimes I'm really exalted from my anger, but other times I need the mighty hand of God to put me through the process again. That sucker likes to show up over and over. And I get it. Oh, be angry and sin not. Every once in a while I can be angry and sin not. But most of the time when I get angry, it ends up sinning somewhere. <laughs> I'm just being honest and transparent. Y'all can straighten your halos up if you want to, but usually when I get angry, something happens. Something bad happens. Something that I end up having to repent for or cry out to God or ask for forgiveness or say I'm sorry to somebody else that, that I lashed out at. Probably my kids and my wife usually. There ain't nobody make you angry like your family does. <laughs> Listen, y'all make me angry and I'll just be nice Christian turn the other cheek let you hit me a couple of times they say one word and I go off the deep end start flipping cheers around doing crazy stuff being dramatic humble yourself before the mind under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in the proper time somebody needs to allow God to lay their hands his hands on them he says having cast all your anxiety on him because he cares about you. He cares about you. He says, be of a sober spirit and be on the alert. You know what I love about putting it in God's hands? It gets you ready. I like it. I read that and I've read it a hundred million times, but when I read it again today, I thought, I like it. I like being sober. Being alert. Not confused, not dazed. I was sitting in my office today and the temperature got up to 75 degrees. Now it's nice in here. And it's 90 something outside. But you know, you're sitting there and you're doing math problems and you like that temperature to be about 68 to 70 degrees in that office. So when it goes up to 75, you start feeling like, I don't want to be here. And I start getting a little dazed. And a little like, uh, you know, well, you know, things start kind of, you know, you just like you, you're not sharp, right? You're not alert, it seemed like. So I thought, I'm done with this, and I started reading my Bible. And I thought, whoa, I like being alert. That's what I like, God. So what I'm saying is, having cast all your anxiety on Him, when the worry's gone, when the anxiety's gone, listen, it, it really didn't say it was gone, it said you just put it in His hands. When you truly put it on his hands, it may go away or it may still be there for you to chew on a little bit. What I like, though, is when it's there, when it's cast on him because he cares about you and you cast it on him not just to get rid of it, but you know he cares. Right? Listen, I, when, I, when I would get upset or hurt, sometimes I'd go to Mama. Mama's in the house tonight. She'll like hearing this. And, and you know, Mama couldn't stop the hurt. Mama couldn't stop the pain. But mama made me feel a little better because mama cared. It, didn't, it wasn't because it went away, but mama cared. And sometimes it didn't go away, but because mama cared, I left mama and I said, I'm going to hit this head on. I'm not going to back down. I'm going to fight. It hadn't left me, but I'm going to fight against it because somebody cared. He said, having cast all that anxiety on him because he cares for you, be now sober. And be alert when you understand that, that anxiety, that worry, that distress, that sin, whatever, you put it in His hands because He cares about you. Then you can become sober in the Spirit. There's something, that, listen, 
It's one thing to even be operating in the Spirit. But being alert and aware and sharp in the Spirit of God. Woo! Baby, it changes everything. I want to tell you, I've had a, I've had a week where I've, I've heard spiritual stories. I've heard stories and testimonies of things that you wouldn't believe. And I'll tell you, I've had a spirit rise up in me and say, that's me. It's unbelievable, ain't it? That's me. I, I'm talking about that's God telling me, identifying, when somebody's telling me the craziest nuthouse story, that that was of them. It wasn't just a story they made up. That was of them. That was of God. Because he cares about you. I like it. When he gets your anxiety and he replaces it with clarity and strength, whatever you're worried about, it's time for it to go. Because it's time to war in the spirit realm. You know, we walk around in the flesh and we worry a whole lot about fleshly things. When we don't understand our warfare is not in the flesh, we're, we're supposed to be warfaring in the spirit. There's things that we need to be warfaring that we need to be fighting that are spiritual things, but we're so wrapped up in our flesh that we can't even war and fight in the spirit realm. Our country will never change till we start fighting spiritually. I, mean, I cannot tell you how many times I have, ta I have talked to somebody and it's just like, who do we vote for? They're all garbage. I know you've got your pick and that's all right, but they're still not the best pick in the world. I mean, we have been set all my life. It seems like I've always voted for the lesser of all the evil. It's not like I had somebody said, oh, that's it. That's the pick. No, it's always who is the lesser of all these evils. And that's not ever going to change in our day and time till we start fighting spiritually and not fleshly. Because it's spiritual things, not fleshly things. But the enemy, he wants you to be all tied up in the physical all wrapped up in the physical so you can't operate in the spiritual. I sat there and thought about the best time that you'll ever have putting it in God's hands when you're operating in the Spirit of God. There ain't nothing better than praying and speaking in tongues, operating in the gift that God gave you, whatever it may be. There's so many good ones, right? There's so many good ones. When you get a hold of one or two of them, you start operating, you'll want them all. You'll get greedy. I, you know, we live in a day and time where people think it's foolishness to operate in the Spirit of God. We, they won't talk about it in church. They want to brush it under because people get so offended. That our, all our denominations, oh, that's just past time. Oh, you're, you're crazy if you start doing that. You know, and, and listen, I love, I'm a teacher by trait, right? I'm a teacher, I, but, and I love teaching the Word of God. But there's some times where we just need to operate in the Spirit of God. I mean, just let, just, if it, whatever, however it appears to be. It's time to put it in his hands. Finish up tonight, he says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The devil really doesn't want to fight you face to face. He's roaring like a lion. He's not a lion. Because if he's a lion, he'd take you on face to face. But he's not like a lion. He roars like a lion. He wants to appear to be really bad. And he really doesn't want to fight you face to face. But what he does, he prowls around seeking someone that he can devour. He's looking for the weak. He's not looking for the strong. He's not looking for a fight. He's looking for somebody he can overwhelm. You understand what I'm talking about? It's time to put it in his hands. So when he comes by, he's like, I ain't messing with that I want none of that. I got to find somebody else to devour. I got to find somebody else. Now, just because that doesn't mean that he won't come at you. Because if he can come at you in your pride, he'll come at you in your pride. Verse 9 says, so resist him. That's how you know he still may test you. You know, he ain't naive. You look the part, but are you the part? He tested Job. Job was the part. He looked the part. The devil said, he ain't the, he ain't the real thing. Take it all away from him, God. Take it all away from him. See if he won't curse you. Take it all away. Job was the real deal. He was the real deal. 
So resist him. Be firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished to your brothers and your sisters who are in the world. That we all kind of got a piece of this same pie that we're chewing on. That we all got a little suffering. That we all got the... I always, and I wish Pastor wasn't here. One of the best things about Pastor Case, one of the most fabulous things everybody I talk to that, that comes in our church that may not be part of us, have, hasn't heard him just one time, two times, is they, they love his transparency. They love how real and honest he is about maybe some things that he deals with and that all of us deal with. It's very attractive when somebody, you realize that we all got stuff we're going through. That we, they ain't none of us holy and righteous above the other. Ain't none of us saying, uh, you know, yeah, you ain't much on Facebook. I got a hundred, you got two. We're not, we're not, we're not really supposed to be like that in the spirit. Why do you think Facebook's like that? Because that's the way people. That's what people are like. That's what people are. So, you know, it, it comes in the church too sometimes. But what's so great, Pastor Cates demonstrates for all of us, is a transparency. But this is real. I go through some of the same things you go through. I wore some of the same things you wore through. There's some things you go through I don't go through. There's some things that, that, that you're strong in that I'm weak in. And there's some things I'm strong in that you're weak in. But the fact of it is we all go through junk. And they, all of us got to put it in God's hands. So resist Him. Be firm in your faith. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished to your, by your brothers and your sisters who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Did you hear that? After all this suffering, that's just for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to eternal glory in Christ will himself confirm, strengthen, and establish you to Him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Stand with us all our house. Let's put it in His hands tonight. Let's just put it in His hands. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for this opportunity to come to You on Wednesday night. I pray, Father, that this Word's just blessed. It's helped. It's encouraged tonight. It's strengthened us, Father, that we would just take whatever it is, whatever, no matter how small we deem it to be, or how great it is in our life right now, that we'll place it in your hands, Father. That when we pray tonight, we'll pray to you, God, and say, God, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to put in your hands, but if I don't know, Lord, what do I need to put in your hands? What do I need to lay in you to let you control it, let you take care of it, so that I can operate in the Spirit of God? Father, I pray bless these folks, Father, tonight, all that's came, and let us worship you and give you glory for all things and all the changes that you're making in our lives and in our spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, Amen.